You're listening to Tone Benders, the Sound Designers Podcast. Let's do this. Hey everybody, welcome to Tone Benders. My name is Tim and I will be your host today. I'm sitting with Renee Coronado in Soundcrafter Studios in Austin, Texas. How are you doing today, Renee? I'm doing great. Loving Austin. Yeah, it's been awesome. And we are sitting here with a goddamn film sound legend Jesus. in the form of John Pritchett. <laughs> John has worked as a production sound mixer on films that have changed the world from Dirty Dancing, The Player, Magnolia, Road to Perdition, Memoirs of a Geisha, There Will Be Blood, Jumanji, Avengers Infinity War, and Avengers end game. Wow. That's a lot of amazing films that I grew up on and I've loved. You've worked on some of my favorites. Uh, you've worked with basically every director that Hollywood can throw at you. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. You've got uh, uh, Mamet, Kasdan, both Kasdans, the father and the son. Uh, and a legacy. Terrence Malick, Judd Apatow, Sam Mendes, Oliver Stone, P.T. Anderson, and also Robert Altman seven times. Yeah. Yep, yep. That can't be someone that anybody can work with. He's pretty demanding, I would imagine. You know, he was a complex human being, and I really liked him a lot. But there were times when, you know, he was cantankerous. But he's the reason that my career took off, honestly. I was working in Dallas and trying to get into doing more film, small films at first, and he came to town. He was looking for some money to do a little film, and the only way he could get it was a guy in Dallas said he'd fund it if he would shoot it in Dallas. So he came to Dallas. He just lost his mixer for many, many years, and he needed somebody in town who could do multi-track in the field, and nobody did or wanted to or could. And so I got that job, a little bitty film, and from that moment on, it's just like having his name that I could put on my resume mm -hmm. just made all the difference. In fact, a guy hired me once for some reason. I said, you don't need my stuff. You've never worked with me. He said, yeah, but you've got Bob Altman's name on your resume. And I went, okay. Mm -hmm. So that's my calling card. Yeah. There was. Well, it's pretty good calling card. <laughs> <laughs> he was an interesting guy. Uh, he did a lot of films. So many films that were really good, so many films that weren't so good. But I did seven of them spread out over a long time because we'd get together, we'd do something, and then we would see each other for two or three years, and then I would do another one. So we were talking before we started rolling about how sometimes it feels like the communication between the post team and the location team isn't what it always should be. I heard you telling a story about one time in, I believe, the early 90s where one of your post-sound teams called you up and wanted you to come in. Can you tell that story? Uh, yeah, I think you're talking about uh, Citizen Cone, a television movie we did. For HBO. For HBO. Uh, yeah, Richard Portman, who was mm -hmm. one of the most admired post-production guys ever in the business, had been Waltman's guy for the longest time. Uh, he called me up one day after where they were doing the mix on this show. He said he wanted me to come over to the studio, and I'm like, oh, my God, why? <laughs> why is, what is that? Tell me, explain something that was wrong. I went over there, and I walked in, and he introduced me to all the crew and all that, and he sat there and told me this was the best wireless work or something he'd ever heard. And I was like... Ah. If you think that, then I guess I'm doing something right. Because we often don't know. We sort of operate in a vacuum a lot of times. You know, we do our stuff. We hand it off to post. If we don't hear anything, then we did okay. If we hear something, it's usually something there's a problem. Uh, and he was so complimentary and so uh, kind of ethereal. He was an interesting guy. Uh, I walked into the, and they had this, the console, big, long, huge console. And over here, he was there. First of all, he was in a dashiki all the way from his neck to the ground. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, and on this pad next to his mixing thing, he had a laid out sheet of black velvet. And on it, he had lots of little bones and little things, little fetishes and stuff like that. And that was his kind of like daily serenity thing. He would just move those stones around and I guess see how his karma was working. I don't know. But anyway, it was a fascinating guy and just made me feel like, you know, that I, I really was doing okay. Well, and for younger listeners, this is not a man that dallied in film. He was nominated for something like oh, 11 yeah. Oscars. Yeah. He'd mix Star Wars. Mm -hmm. He mixed Nashville, like some of the most groundbreaking sound films ever. Got the sound award for Nashville. Yes. So that must have been a pretty mind-blowing experience to have someone of that pedigree come it want was. to talk to you about how great you're doing. It was. But it was followed by a very bizarre incident. I, I left his place and went over to be interviewed by the sound department at Warner Brothers for a film I was going to do for a uh, show in, in Austin, Texas. And they were committed at that time to analog. And digital was just starting to really happen most everywhere else. But they were deeply committed to analog. And I was supposed to meet their chief engineer. Uh, and I met him before I met the head of the department. 
and a, a German fellow who had been working for Nagar for most of his life, I guess, and it, he said hello to me, and the first thing he said was, you know, Chan, when you go digital, you have ruined this sound forever. <laughs> and I went, oh, dear. <laughs> well, that was the mentality when digital came out, because digital, I mean, it legit, at the very beginning, didn't sound as good as analog. Well, that's true. Uh, but he claimed that it was fatiguing his post-production engineers' ears and all that sort of stuff. And, they were, <laughs> in, in a, and of course, ultimately, they went fully digital. In fact, they went way far. Uh, but it was an interesting experience to be on the edge of that because I kind of was. Yeah, you I were was, one of the first to go digital. I was, I think I was the second guy in L.A. to do it. Yeah. Uh, and we had so little to work with. I mean, we were little tiny recorders, little Sony two-track, no time code recorders. And uh, so it was it was risky. But uh, here we So are. what were you recording on to? Uh, literally a Sony D10, a little tiny little cassette. That. Yeah. That was all new. Yeah. And uh, I had backed up for a while on, a, on, on Nagra. Jeff Wexler was the guy who was ahead of me, and he, he did exactly the same thing. And then both of us at one point went, I don't know why we're doing this Nagra thing. They're not using it, and it's just, you know, we're getting better stuff over here, so we just abandoned that. And for a couple of shows, I went with this one little tiny recorder. And then everybody jumped on the bandwagon and said, okay, we have to make a better recorder, bigger recorder. We have to have time code. We have to have all that kind of stuff. And so now we were two-track time-coded, and that's where we went for a while. Uh, until Zaxcom, a company that uh, is now kind of dominating, came up with a four-track. Mm -hmm. And that opened it up even more. The only difficulty was Bob Altman was on the scene, and all that was available was analog. <clears throat> and his first early engineers had found a way to take a studio machine, a Stevens machine, into the field, an eight-track recorder. And that's what they did, and that's what I inherited. I was like the third guy who worked with him to do that sort of stuff. And it was very peculiar because the recorder was, it had a sync track on it that we had to make one actually for it, a crystal for it. And there were times when I was recording on it when I'd literally have a screwdriver stuck over on the oscillator adjustment to try to move it. As it would get to the end of the reels, it would want to go faster or want to go slower. And I would adjust it while I was mixing. What? It was that, it was that bizarre. <laughs> but it worked. And uh, as soon as I could, I, I took him to uh, digital because they finally came out with the digital eight-track recorders. Mm -hmm. And that we moved that way. And that's where I went from there on. And now it's a, the curse and the blessing of the industry. Everybody wants to do it. So what are you recording to now? I record to Zaxcom, uh, an eight-track. I'm still on an eight-track. I found that I don't really need to. I mean, it's gotten so elaborate out there. Some of these guys going out there were 16-track and even 24-track stuff. On a big music production, like Les Miserables or something like that, that makes sense. But for what we do, it doesn't. And I did these two Avengers movies, and we had sometimes 16, 18 people in a scene. For sure. And I just said at the beginning, I said, I'm not going to do that. There's a way to do this where I don't have to make that many tracks. I don't have to do that much stuff. And we did it. And they were incredibly happy with what we did. So gave them. what's the way? Well, you have to plan what you're doing with the actors. Who's going to be in the scene? And how many are actually going to be talking, for one thing? And are they going to talk all the time or are they going to have a line over here? Right. And so we used a boom microphone quite a bit too. The editor was very pleased with that because that's really what he, he knew he could lean on that. If we had that on whoever was on camera, then he was golden. So uh, we just gave them the things that they needed and not just everything. So you're hopping actor to actor from yeah. track to track. Yeah. I had a guy, I have one, this brilliant utility guy with me who was moving microphones around all day, all the time. Some of the costumes would be wired, like, permanently. Built into it. Yeah. Built into it, and he would just jump transmitters. So it was it was exciting. And you're, you're having to document all that on the fly? We document it, yes. Uh, I use a program called Movie Slate, mm -hmm. which operates off of an iPad in my case. And all the metadata is on there. We have to be careful to put all that on there, and then all that gets transferred to post. Well, in the first place, it goes to editorial because post didn't get involved till later, as usual. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have all that information as long as we're diligent about getting that on there. Mm -hmm. That was a big transitional thing, too, for a lot of guys that weren't used to, like, naming their tracks. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we did, I was writing them, handwriting them, which was awful because it was a big messy, my handwriting was terrible, <laughs> big messy log sheets. And when they came up with this program, uh, Movie Slate, it would just change my world tremendously. You could read what I was putting down. <laughs> And then you got to have the director and the AD have your back on that workflow. Yeah, you do. Uh, yes, you have to have the ADs particularly because if, if you slow things down, they want to know why. Mm -hmm. So we would pre-wire as much as we possibly could. My third would come in an hour or so before call and just work with the costumers. And it was brilliant to work with the costumers. So the costumers actually had all learned how to do most of the wiring part themselves, where to put the transmitters. Because some of the costumes were just really, really difficult to do. 
Scarlett Johansson is one of the worst because it was all tight, mm -hmm. you know, vinyl and leather and that sort of stuff. And then to find a place that wasn't going to make a lot of the racket. Mm -hmm. We did the uh, pilot for Westworld, which was incredibly difficult because some of the costumes were made out of vinyl. Mm -hmm. So that was a situation where we would get the best we could in the masters. A lot of it would be not usable, but we had a boom or two in there, and we would get the proper part. And you talked about how going to 8-track is both a blessing and a curse. Yeah, because then it gave you... Well, people had this kind of mistaken idea about what Robert Altman did. He didn't really just put microphones on everybody and just let them all talk. He had a plan most of the time. Uh, a lot of times we would have like three or four people who were the main characters. And then if, if you wanted to hear somebody in that little group over there, we put a microphone on that group and over there on that group. So we'd have something to go to, to pick around. There were some scenes that we shot in some movies where we tried to mic everybody that we could. But again, we were limited back then, really most of the time to like six people, uh, a boom track and a sync track or a mix track. And uh, so that made it a bit challenging. But he, uh, he did have an idea. It wasn't just let's just get everybody. So people misinterpreted that. And then you get people who say, well, let's just do it like Bob Altman did it. Let's just get everybody. <laughs> you know, how's this, how's this going to work? Yeah. Uh, so we, uh, we kind of changed that a bit. I did tell people that we're not really going to do this like Robert Altman. Let's just get what it is you need. And so that's how we got around having to have, you know, so many tracks. That's definitely a story we've heard in the past is that, you know, you'll, you'll be asked to put up 24 mics because you got that many people going to speak that day or whatever. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's, there's got to be a political navigation to, to kind of get a tighter track count to, to work. There is. There is. If you're working with directors like the Russo brothers, if you talk to them about something that's going to slow the day down, whatever solution you can come up with, <laughs> they don't want to slow the day down. Yeah. They're not going to wait on us. Uh, and they know that they always have the option in those big old movies to, you know, to replace everything if they want to. And so it was really gratifying after the first couple of weeks on that movie when uh, Jeff Ford, the editor, came to us and said, this is the best stuff we've ever gotten. When, like, well, good Lord, I can't imagine what, what could be worse because <laughs> it was so, <laughs> <laughs> it was so a lot of frustrating. But uh, at the same time, we gave them what they actually needed without slowing them down. Uh, they knew they had the option, and when they got through, the sound and post-production supervisor, after the second movie was released, called me up out of the blue and said, I just want you to know that we looped almost nothing in this movie. Oh, almost nothing. That's killer. It was, because I just assumed that they would. But, you know, you realize when you look at a movie like that and list, listen to a movie like that, there's so much going on in those yeah, tracks. Yeah, hide. The little, yes, the little problems are just, you know, they're, they're hidden. They're not there or they're easy to deal with. The amazing thing about Ford was that he would make these really polished edits for dailies where he would deal with all those little things. Sound guy wasn't even there. He was doing it himself. Mm -hmm. So there are some editors out there who can do that. Yeah. We were lucky. And the, the first person to get your tracks is the assistant to the film editor. Mm -hmm. That's and right. So they get your tracks and, and they sync them up and bring them in. Do you have communication with them? Do you have communication with the editors? If there's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it's uh, there. We, we set that up early. I mean, I, my habit has always been to call those guys right off the bat before we ever start shooting. Mm -hmm. Some of them, sometimes, rarely, sometimes there'll be a sound person involved, at least in early discussions. Uh, and if they're there, I'll do that sound too. Sound post person. Sound post production guy. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, that's a very important to me to, to talk to those guys and make sure if, if there's a problem, call me. Let me know what it is so we can deal with it right away. Or if there's something you want. You want more of this or you want an extra thing or you want a little sound effects or something. Tell me uh, and we'll do our best to get them. I heard you talk in a previous interview about how you consider yourself a sound mixer where you consider a lot of other people new to the game sound gatherers. That's, that's correct. When I was starting all this stuff, we had a monaural Nagra recorder and we were having to make a mix because that was going to be largely what they were using. You know, they could obviously move things around and, and, and make cuts on the mag film and make it, you know, get the pops and all that out, but it took a lot of time. Uh, I would make a mix. And, and I came from the recording studio where I was making a mix every day. So I just have kept that method all of my career. When all this came in with all the multi-tracks and all that kind of stuff, it became less important to a lot of these guys to have a, a mix. They loved it in dailies. That's what Alban liked. That's the reason I kept the job is because he, he got dailies with a mix on it instead of three chosen tracks because that's all I could do back then was three mm -hmm. tracks. And so uh, I've just tried to do that the whole time, which is frustrating sometimes because I may not get time to correct something. So that take two, I can fix that. And also with the advent of uh, reality TV is the guys don't mix. 
they just try to get it all and let Post deal with it. Mm-hmm. And the Post people that have come up like that, that's kind of what they want too. So they've become the mixers. We've had a dialogue editor's roundtable where I think it was only one of the three actually uses the mix track. Mm -hmm. Everybody else came off the ISOs, even with good mix tracks, just based off of their workflow. Yeah, I had this conversation on this movie that I just finished where we were talking to post-production guys, and I said, what are you using? They thought they had a problem with with a particular piece. I said, well, what are you using? And they said, well, we're on the ISO track. And I went, did you listen to the mix? And they went, uh, well, I no. And I went, why don't you go listen to the mix and see what you got? Because I'm ironing out a lot of those little problems while I'm making the mix. I'm dipping stuff and things that I know they're coming. And so I can, you know, deal with it kind of a little bit right there. Uh, and they were happy they did that. The bad thing about not listening to the mix is because a lot of times in dailies, the first dailies that hear the director hears, he's just, he is going to hear my mix mm-hmm. because I don't have time to do all that other stuff. Yep. And then when he goes back and he hears it after they have remixed it, it's going to be different. Mm-hmm. So he may not hear that thing that he thought he heard. The other bad part about that kind of thing is once they hear a mix, just like once they see uh, an onset video assist edit, they get locked in their minds. It's, that's what it's supposed to look like. And then that picture editor is kind of stuck with, well, now what do I do? Mm-hmm. Do I do what you saw in dailies or I, you know, do it the way I want to do it? Yeah, that's something that happens in post with music a lot is they put mm-hmm. temp music in the edit. Oh, yeah. And then the composer comes in with different music and exactly. nobody likes it because they're used to hearing, you know, the and pop song. And some of these that. editors that I've worked with, they actually do that for dailies. I mean, they'll, they'll mm-hmm. put some music in of some sort, maybe from a movie that the director had done before. Uh, and yes, it does kind of lock you in. Well, anymore, the workflow is actually going that way to where they're they're starting to compile the edit on sets. I know. That that's actually going to be used, and they have that headspace. Like that's yeah. that's what the intent is. It's right. not it's not just temp. They're actually they're getting the edit. Yeah. And the time frame is so short. A lot of these movies, yes, they got to get this stuff out. We did this last Jumanji at the beginning of last year, and it came into the theaters at the end of last year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm with miles and miles of CG and all that, so I don't know how they did it. But, uh, and so that's when it, I think it's really important that we make sure that we give them something that they can go to so they don't have to go back to everything. They don't have to go back and tear everything apart and try to rebuild it. And the guy that I worked with, the post-production guy on that is an old friend of mine who was my boom operator for many, many years, and he's posted a whole lot of movies that I do. And he's always commenting about the fact that if we get a great mix track, from his point of view, we really know what we have to work with. Yeah. Uh, and then if there's a problem, we'll go find the problem and fix that. So as a mixer, you talk about your boom operator. Can you talk about the relationship of a mixer to a boom op and what that communication process is like? Sure. Uh, I've been blessed in my career. I've had two boom operators that have occupied most of my career. Some here and there on, on one little thing or one other thing, but my first longtime boom operator, Joel Schrack, who's a post-production supervisor now, we did 15 years together. Wow. And the fellow who's been working with me now, uh, David Roberts, We've done 27, no, 26 years together. We've been together 26 <laughs> years, like an old married couple. <laughs> um, and our relationship is, I don't know if it's the same as other guys, but we don't have to talk to each other a lot because he knows what he's going to do. He runs the set and I run the other end of it. Mm-hmm. And we try to get a good third person in the middle of all that. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's been great for me. I mean, that's the thing is we don't give these guys enough credit. Uh, I always try whenever somebody says, oh, this thing was really great and so forth. And it compliments me. I could, you got to remember that I'm just part of this team. You know, it takes us all to do it. Yeah, the unique skill of a boom op is to anticipate where that line's coming from and get the mic in place before the person starts talking, which is no easy feat. Lawrence Kasdan uh, did a number of pictures with. He stated many times openly that he thinks the hardest job on the set is the boom operators. Not to take away from all what it takes to be an assistant camera person, all those things. The hardest job because the boom operator has to know many, many things. He has to know lenses. He has to look for lighting situations, how to dodge lights, how to work with the gaffers and people to get what he needs to avoid shadows and things. He also has to be political. He has to be able to, you know, deal mm-hmm. with actors yep. and all that. He has to filter. I say he always has to filter what he hears from me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say something. He'll calm it down. I say, you tell that Mr. Pritchard would like you to do. <laughs> so uh, it's been a great relationship, a long time thing. And uh, uh, but I think that's more of a West Coast thing. I know guys in New York mixers and boom operators, they all switch around. They work with each other. They're much more fluid in that way. People on the West Coast tend to be more a team effort. Yeah. Uh, long term. Well, it's interesting that you should describe yourself as a West Coast person because you live in Austin, right? Yeah. So you're traveling. Well, I guess movies are shot all around the world, so you're traveling wherever you need to go. Yes, but I'm in a union, and my union uh, local is in Los Angeles. When I moved from Dallas eventually to Los Angeles to expand my career. And what year would that have been? Uh, 90 
97, okay. I think. Yeah, 97. Uh, I met the woman that I'm married to now, and we had our first child, and we did what we call our tour of duty. We were there for like three or four years and said, man, I got to raise him here. So that's when we moved back to Texas. We're both Texans. But I've spent the first three years of that time back in L.A. working all the time. It's been very variable in terms of where we work or where we work from because the industry has moved around. The incentives that, that started happening some years ago really put a damper on working in L.A. at first because they were trying to deal with runaway production going to Canada, frankly. Uh, I don't know what you're talking uh, about. And that's, that's, that's what started it. <laughs> and then it started running away to other places. But and so the, Atlanta. The, the, well, the states got this brilliant idea that, well, we can do that. If Canada can do it, we can do it too. Yeah. So they started this incentive thing, and California did not try to keep pace. So it just all fell apart. And everybody left there. Production left there and went to different places. It didn't come here because our incentives in Texas were not very good. Uh, went to New Mexico, Louisiana to begin with, yep. and then uh, North Carolina and lots of places and ended up primarily in Georgia. Yep. And I spent the past three years working in Georgia. Yeah, that's where the Avengers films were. Yeah, also. Uh, and yeah. Jumanji's. And Jumanji, okay. Yeah. Uh, it's an unfortunate thing when you can't do a movie in a place where you want it to be. And you really have to go someplace because there's the money, mm-hmm. because the money's there. Southern California is still one of the best places in the world to shoot movies because of the weather Mm -hmm. and so forth. But we've adapted, and now there are great crews in in Georgia and in New Mexico and lots of places. They're all over the place. How do you go about getting your gear to these places? (laughs) Um, They used to just pack it and put it on pallets and have somebody palletize it and ship it with the regular shippers. Invariably, something would get broken or hurt. Of course. So several years ago, I started using this company called Pods. Okay. Okay. Them. Pods. Yeah. Yeah. So Pods is like a, um, they're like a home moving company, That's what right? they are. So they'll come and like load up all your stuff into a pod and like go put it in a storage unit without unpacking it. That's correct. Okay. So what do you mean by pod? Well, that's the name of the company. Well, I know, but what are they like? It's a big container. It's a big, it's a big container. It's like, the, okay. it's like a box truck without yeah. the truck. Without the truck. Okay. I use a, an 8 by 16 and I put all my stuff in that truck. We, we pack it, we lock it, and it goes into storage. And whenever I say I'm going to here, they'll pick it up and take it there. And then it goes back when I'm done. Goes usually, back to L.A. Is that no, the no, no. I usually leave, I usually leave my gear wherever the last job was. Okay. Uh, I left it in Atlanta for a long time, and then I did a show in uh, New Mexico, and they just transferred it to New Mexico, and now I'm not exactly sure where my next show is going to be. So they brought it back here to Texas. It's the cheapest, safest way to do it. I've never had anything broken at all. That's interesting. In all these years of doing it, it's just such a weird thing because they're a moving company, not a shipping company. Yes. And the studios don't know how to deal with that. So basically, I just pay for it and then get the studio to reimburse me. It's like a mobile storage unit. That's what it but is. But they have a warehouse or they have like, oh, not a warehouse, but they have property all over the place. That's like a storage unit. And they'll just go take it to one of their storage It, it, it is warehousing. They put it in climate-controlled warehousing. Okay. Yeah. So it doesn't sit out in the elements all the time. Although I have done that on a couple of shows, just left it out in the parking lot. Yeah. Uh, but that's how we get it around. That's cool. It's gotten to where my package, like everybody's packages, has gotten so huge in order to accommodate us in video assist and so forth, we used to take up one tiny portion of a camera truck. Now we have to have an entire truck, half for us, half for video assist, usually. That's how we go. And then big trucks, because we have so much stuff. We don't need all that stuff. What kind of stuff is it? Well, just everything that we, we've used once sometimes. Like I've got a full, huge PA system, <laughs> because I've used it two or three times on something. Uh, I have Pro Tools kit. I have, you know, all that kind of stuff. And just tons of little things that you probably may, may have used once or twice, but you are afraid not to have it in case somebody else has a genius idea. <laughs> it's the same thing as having all branches of, of filmmaking. For instance, prop trucks used to be pretty small, but now prop trucks are at least one forty footer and maybe two because they have to be able to basically poop out a prop that somebody just thought up. We did this uh, show called The Memoirs of a Geisha, and the prop masters went to Japan and brought back just tons of amazing props, but one-of-a-kind props. And we're doing this scene, and she's got a little teacup that's, that's a green teacup. And the director went out and looked at it and says, do you have that in red? <laughs> she was like, no. I mean, <laughs> you know, it was like, but a truck full of stuff, and he was obsessed about the color of the teacup. But we have the same kind of things. All of a sudden, you, you'll say, well, can you, uh, we want to put this actor over here off camera, or several actors off camera. Have you got a system so they can hear each other talking over there? And how many people? Well, two. How many really? Six. <laughs> uh, 
I'll tell you a funny story about uh, when we did the movie The Player. The Player, believe it or not, started off with... This all is the, a Robert Altman movie. Yeah, uh, yeah. Tim Robbins started yes. it, right? Yeah. He came up and I said, well, what are we going to do on this? Because there was not, no real plan. And uh, he said, well, look, it's going to be easy. It's got maybe four people talking. Four people. <laughs> okay. So we started shooting it on... Uh, started setting up on a Friday. We were supposed to rehearse on Saturday. It was a, basically a camera shot that was going to be an endless shot uh, camera following a bunch of different people as it would come in and out of a scene, out of the camera view. And immediately there were eight people talking. And I had eight microphones that we had in the package for that thing. And as we would go through the rehearsal, he would say, well, this person is going to say something over here too. I said, okay. So I started making phone calls on a Saturday in L.A. when wireless microphones were not all that prevalent, mm-hmm. trying to find more wires to wire these people up with. In the meantime, they realized that the parking lot was in such a trashy place that the crane couldn't roll over it smoothly. So mm-hmm. they pulled everything off of it, and we rehearsed, sort of, in another way, while they asphalted the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> so then we were supposed to go back and start shooting then on Sunday morning, and the lot wasn't completely solid, so we shot some little other pieces, <laughs> and then we started shooting in the afternoon. And also, uh, Robert Altman was not very technological. He didn't realize that the crane could just keep going round and round and round. It had a limit of cables. It could go like one and a quarter turns. So they had to change the idea about that. Eventually, he had so many people on there, we had 14 microphones, which I had scrounged from literally everywhere. And we've done this shot a couple of three times, and he adds one more voice. (laughs) And I said, bye, we don't have any more microphones. He was the one who came up with the idea. If you ever see the scene, there's a girl walking across the lot talking to somebody else, and she's got a clipboard in front of her. And she walks around, walks out of the scene, and then we come around to the other side. and Because it's a one fellow, continuous shot. One like shot. It's just yep. constant. Never stop. Yeah. And the fellow who's giving a tour of the studio to somebody, he's got a clipboard. Well, the microphone is on the clipboard. You just changed the clipboard. And, and that was his idea. I was, I was so frantic trying to figure out something. That was Bob's idea. I was, well, sure. And it worked. Uh, and we made, I forgot how many takes, about 13 takes. And when you see it in the movie, it's like seven or eight. If it starts off on the, with the clapper, with the scene number. Well, before we shot that last thing, he said, I got to give one more. And that really was the limit. We were done. And so he said, okay, then I'll loop it. He hated the idea of looping. And there is a looped line in that shot. Hmm. I can spot it instantly, but most people can't. Yeah. Uh, and that was shot was until very recently, until the video digital age was the longest opening shot ever done. Now they're talking about all the time some of these shots that are some of the movies are coming out now, like uh, 1917, like 1917, where it's supposed to look like one long, long shot. Yep. The bad thing about the long, long shots is it's taken a real toll on camera operators and boom operators because these shots are going for 20, 25 minutes, whatever it is. It's injurious. Although I have a friend that's gone and seen 1917, and he said it was a transformational experience. I understand that. You know? It's true. I actually interviewed the production mixer from 1917, oh, yeah. Stuart Wilson. Yeah. And uh, he said that it was a nightmare just for transmitters because yeah. they were covering so much territory in each shot. Yeah, I've talked to Stuart a number of times. He's advised me on a couple of things. He's a great guy. He, w- he was a great yeah. guy, actually. <laughs> he was really fun to talk to. Yeah, We do that sometimes. We talk to each other because we don't ever work with each other. That was one of my questions for you. We, we talk sometimes through our boom operators or people that, that we do work with. If we get somebody who worked on something else who can come over and work with us on a second unit or something, we find out things. And whenever I see a movie that I really like, I like to call up the mixer. And just, you know, tell him what I thought about it and ask him about the experience. And Stuart is one of those guys. He's like the king of it mm-hmm. over in England. You ever get surprised watching a mix back at any of the production dialogue? When I see it in the theater? When you see it in the theater. Oh, Lord. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, especially big, big CG movies and so forth. It's like I, I did those movies, The Avengers, and then I saw the movie and I went, where was I? What scene was that? You know, <laughs> there's none of that's there. You know, when you're shooting it. But yeah, I love to go do that. Uh, sometimes just to pick it apart. Maybe what I, I'd like for it to have been better. But usually, post production guys these days are so good that they're not going to let something go out there that's mm-hmm. problematic. Right. The one thing they can't fix unless they decide to loop it is they can't fix an actor who will not enunciate. Uh, one of the biggest problems I think we all have is that the director, the script supervisor, all these people, they know the dialogue. If they're not looking right at it, they already know it. They've worked on it for months in rehearsals and so forth. I think of myself as the only person on the set who's listening to the dialogue like the audience would, mm-hmm. like Fresh the first ears, time, yeah. you know, and I kind of think I've mastered that thing. If I can listen to it 20 times, but I still hear it as if I'd never heard it. Mm-hmm. The difficulty we have is being able to, to correct something 
because of the egos and so forth, it's hard to have a relationship sometimes where you can say to the actor, I really didn't understand what you just said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't really do that. Uh, I have had those relationships with some actors that are, that are friends who I've been able to say. Is that something a director could say to an actor? We, we always go to the director. Yeah. We never go directly, except in those rare occasions. And then a lot of times the directors will not want to interfere with whatever the actor's got mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I understand that completely, but it is still, I think, my responsibility to say. Definitely. You don't, if you don't understand them, yes, they can say to you, well, I'm selling it with my expression or with something else that's going on, and the audience will understand. That may be true, but it also may not be true. It's also a problem, as uh, someone who worked in post, that on set, they say it too quietly, too mumbly. Okay, we'll loop it. Mm -hmm. But then when you loop it in a clear voice, it doesn't match what they're, they're, the image of how they're saying it. And then that's even worse. I've had that conversation a few times. My biggest one is whenever you have an actor who cannot imagine the sounds that are going to be around them in post. Mm. They walk into a rock club or something yeah. that's really loud, and they're still talking like I'm talking to you right now. Yeah. And I say, you know, it's going to be really loud in here when this is in post. But what do you want me to do? Well, imagine that it's going to be really loud in here. <laughs> what would you do? Naturally. I worked with a few actors. Kevin Costner was one of them, reminded me, was an actor who really did understand that. I remember him once shooting some scenes in a bar in the movie Wyatt Earp where he actually got on the extras. And his other fellow actors would say, it's loud in here, guys, come on, speak up. That's pretty rare. Yeah. Uh, but I try to think in terms of the soundscape that this film's going to have when it comes out and get them to think that way too. And... Uh, Oddly enough, so many actors out there can pretend about a lot of things, but that's one thing they can't pretend very well. Mm -hmm. So to aid that kind of conversation, other people need to have your back. Other people need to be listening to the mix mm -hmm. during the takes. Who are those key people, and how do you communicate with them? Well, the director, obviously. The directors, they listen. But again... They got their mind on a million things. On, exactly. They're looking at their... They're watching their actors, and they're thinking about this, and they're hearing every word because they know the words. Yeah. So when I would say something like, well, there was a horrible jet that went through that, and I go, oh, where the, oh, I, I didn't hear it. Well, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> I heard it. Uh, do you want to do it again or not? And I'm okay with whatever you want to do because I, I call myself a service organization. You know, we're there to provide them what, what we can, what they want. Uh, I try to leave my ego in the truck uh, because I think of us as craftsmen and not so much artists. People like to think of themselves in the film business, everybody's an artist. And that's really not true. There are a lot of crafts that are just really crafts. You know, they're really uh, artisans. Mm -hmm. And if I get that, then I'm happy. So you were saying a second ago that when you see a film that's mixed really well, you phone the person up and mm -hmm. talk to them. I do. That is all good when you have uh, multiple Oscar nominations and you've worked on <laughs> humongous films. But someone who's either starting out in their career or doesn't have that kind of resume can't just phone up somebody. How do you recommend that they continue learning? Well, oddly enough, uh, that's kind of where I, I got started when I was inexperienced and so forth. Is I did find a way to call up somebody. You know, I went to resources and, or maybe through the union or what, something like that and would just ask them, talk to them about it. How'd that go? What was the hardest part for you in that particular thing? And most of the people in our line of work, it sound people are very helpful. Yep. There really are not too many people. I mean, camera guys, that's, that's a different story. Yeah, they're all a bunch of jerks. <laughs> <laughs> I have some good friends who are camera guys, but it is true that, that they're, they think of what they do a lot of times is their artful tricks. Uh, we don't have any tricks. We just have the things that we've figured out how to do. And, and if you can help somebody else do it, that's what we do. And I did benefit from that a lot early right. on. I guess I, maybe I was being bold by calling them up and asking them, but, you know, you don't ask. Mm -hmm. I mean, as an editor and a mixer on a much smaller scale, obviously, I mean, I, I love it when people want to have conversations about the mm -hmm. work as it's coming through me. Absolutely. Sure. And when good work comes through me, I, I don't even often know who the heck it was sometimes. Yeah. That did the production sound and if there's good production sound that's like I'd, I'd love to let people know that we did a little film that went to sundance and it was like it came to us in a weird format because it was like recorded on a zoom h4 but there was just the backup tracks we didn't recognize that the editor like didn't have the actual real tracks they were using the backup tracks off the h4 or well, we got the actual sound rolls in mm. and it was almost all boom but it was incredibly well done easiest dialogue track in the world to deal with we had to figure out who the heck it was so we could go give them a high five you know <laughs> Um, but it was not apparent to us because the production audio track goes through a lot of hands before it gets to the dialogue editor and the sure. mixer. And so that's where a lot of that line of communication uh, tends to evaporate. It does. Um, that's why I said I, at the very beginning, as soon as I can find out who those people are, 
then I'm in touch with them, often well before they're ever on the show. Yeah. But even when you get in touch with them, you're talking to the sound super or the re-recording mixers. Right? Usually, you're not talking yeah. to the dialogue editors. No, not usually. Because they're the ones that are really getting down in the they're dirt the with your tracks. They are. They're digging in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a craft that I really wish that I had some skill at, but I didn't ever, I didn't come up that way. I came up with the recording studio. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I have approached all through my career more recording actors the same way I approach recording musical singers, is they are the artists. And I respect that. And I want you know them to know that I do. And then I'm not just getting into their shit because I, they're uh, causing me problems. Mm-hmm. I really am thinking about them because from my point of view, the most important thing is the dialogue. Even if it's not used, even if it's you know just a, a background to everything else, to me, that's why I'm here. It is the most important part. Yep. for me. And there are some directors out there who have come around to that too and have said things like, you know, sometimes for them the sound is more important than the picture. There's a video I just saw the other day uh, that's being sent for Oscar consideration, I think, that was all about sound, all about what we do. Maybe you've seen this thing. It just finished recently. That is all the aspects of all parts of the sound. Making program. Waves, the, the documentary. Documentary. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Yeah. We've had the director from that documentary on our podcast. Really captured so, yeah. everything that... Has it been out for a while? Well, it played in festivals. Okay. I thought it was just fantastic. Even from somebody who's been doing it for many, many years, it gave me we did a better perspective about what all really goes into it. Mm-hmm. Most people out in the world think all sound is done in post. They think everything's overdubbed and looped and all that sort of stuff. And they think of sound as sound effects. Yes. Mm-hmm. They're so impressed with Foley. Mm-hmm. It's impressive to do that kind of stuff, but they think it's all that. Uh, so I'm still grateful that the Academy still considers us part of the for sure, <laughs> of yeah. the ward. Well, they've tried for years to really cut it down, and you know they cut down years ago. They they took sound editing out. It used to be three awards, uh, and the sound editing now is just considered part of post or sound effects. So mm-hmm. they've been trying to get it off of the show for years too. They mm-hmm. think it's yeah. just, it takes mm-hmm. up time and advertising and so forth. It seems like they have a hard time, like the Academy itself. I guess, judging and evaluating it as a, oh, as yeah. a body anyway, yeah. right? My wife always says it's always the loudest show that wins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's kind of right because 70% of the Academy is actors. And, uh, you know, we all nominate. We all do all that kind of stuff, but they're the ones that do the final voting. Well, we all vote, but there's so many of them, and they really don't know, and that's okay. Well, speaking of actors, when you won your uh, Lifetime Achievement Award from mm-hmm. the Cinema Audio Society, Jack Black gave you the award. And his lead-off joke was that doing sound is like doing plastic surgery. You only notice when it's done That's bad. right. <laughs> so, That's uh, a good line. <laughs> yeah. How do you manage to keep such a high reputation in an industry where you don't want to be noticed? Like, how do you get the trust of your new people? Well, I, you know, I get my work through individuals, either the, the director or the production manager or the producer, somebody who knows me, who knows somebody else that I've worked for. It's kind of been passed along like that. So the whole Altman thing was the greatest connection I ever had. So I could get an entree into somebody just because I could say that name, Mm -hmm. just because I could say I've done this work, and they would go, oh, well. I've had a lot of interviews with directors who really wanted to talk more about that than about what I do. (laughs) What are you going to do for me? No, tell me about Bob Altman. I was like, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But that kind of has worked for me. A lot of guys will work for a director maybe one time, something went wrong, and they never work for that person again. The greatest compliment we can have is to be hired more than once by the same director. And I've been really lucky to have several directors who I've worked with a number of times. The bad part about that is if you get out of sync with them, you may not, you still may not work with them again. Just because, time-wise. Time-wise, yeah. yeah. Uh, I've, I've worked a lot with Peyton Reed, who had directed both of the new Ant-Man. Yep. Ant-Man's. Ant-Man's? <laughs> Ant-Man. Ant-Person. <laughs> um, and he he and I get along great. We're like friends. And he calls me for everything that he does, but he called me for the first Ant-Man, and I was booked on something else. So then he called me for the second Ant-Man, and I was booked on something else. And after a while, they're sort of like, well, are you ever going to be available for me? <laughs> so we'll see about the next one. <laughs> They've got another one coming up. Yeah. And another Jumanji. Wow. So you're going to be a busy man. i got to retire one of these days. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> you talk about the work as a craft, um, and that has technical like implications, right? The big change, obviously, being the sale of the wireless spectrum. Oh, yeah. And also, kind of broadly, the ability of post to plate and wipe out boom balls. Yeah, that's a thing that I wish we could do more in this country. I mean, the editor I mentioned to you, Jeff Ford, who did the... Uh, Avengers, he told me uh, about the second or third week, he says, listen, if you need to get the boom in there, you need to get it in there for something that's important, just do it, and I'll take it out. 
The production manager was standing right beside her. He said, whoa, 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 hold on. That's a budgetary consideration. <laughs> it's expensive to do, no matter what you do. But it is happening more and more. In England, they've been doing it quite a lot, I understand. Because it turns out it's just quicker, faster. They get better sound. Yeah. And they have that extra cost. And CG is getting much and much better, cheaper to do. I would love to do it as much as possible. But again... I was listening to a different podcast, the Location Sound podcast, mm-hmm. and they were talking to the person that does production sound for a house of cards. Mm-hmm. And basically, they had a set of ground rules for situations where they could get the boom in the shot because, you know, in TV, you know, different directors come in for, you know, for Each every episode. Every episode. Yep. And so they would have fun with the directors and put the boom in the shot. And, and freak the them out. <laughs> well, you know, on. I was about to say that one of the things that gets in our way is it's like a knee-jerk reaction when you see the boom in the frame even if you're in front of blue screen, because the blue screen is great for us. We can bring yeah. the microphone right down to their yeah. face. But even then, it's it's a distraction to a director or DP who's not used to it. Or even if they're used to it, it still catches them. Yeah. And so if they cannot see it, they prefer not to see it. It goes against their training. It is. And there's been many times we've had like a situation where there's so many things in the frame that we're not going to see later on. And then the boom comes in and somebody will make a <laughs> remark and we'll go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Look around. <laughs> Do you care about the words the man is saying? It's all coming out of this. Don't worry about this. But still, it's a moving thing in the frame, and it freaks them out. Yeah. We're fighting that. But yes, it would be better if we could do more stuff where we could give that technology to be used by us to make the soundtrack better. Yeah. What's the hardest film you've ever worked on? Do you mean hard physically or hard emotionally? <laughs> Both. <laughs> give us one of each. Well, people ask me all the time, says, what was your favorite film to work on? And I say, well, you mean the one that did well in the theater or the one that was fun? Yeah. Fun ones. Um, well, you mentioned Dirty Dancing. Dirty Dancing was a pain in the ass. It was really hard. Uh, personalities and all kinds of things that happened. And it was a really low budget. That movie was made for $6 million. And it was the biggest wow. movie that Vestron ever had. And it carried that company for years and years and years. But it was hard to do because of some personalities that were involved. And the producer, a woman producer, who just made everybody's life miserable. Mm. So... And it was a big success. And it's my daughter's, one of her favorite movies. And so I can say, well, it's a mixed blessing. I I love (laughs) the fact that she loves it. Um, I did a Jake Cassidy movie that probably a lot of people didn't see uh, called Sex Tape. Yeah, I know which one. Never had so much fun on a movie in my life. I mean, it was a laugh. Cameron Diaz movie, right? Yeah, Cameron Diaz, Jason Segel. Laughed our butts off every day, all day long. And I I have this kind of thing in my mind that says, if it's too much fun on the set, it's not going to be great in the theater. And I was right. <laughs> uh, you know, they cut out all the fun stuff because the fun is happens before action and after cut. And it was just a lark. The whole thing was just fabulous. So that was a great fun experience. Um, most of the movies that I've done with Tom Hanks have been wonderful movies to do. So you did both the movies that he directed, right? Yes. So that thing you do and Larry Crown. And Larry Crown. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Uh, yeah, he's just great. He's just everything you want. I just finished a movie with him. Well, that thing you do must be tough because there was so much live, well, playback music. It was mostly playback. Yeah. Uh, but it was just the idea of pouring it together mixed with live stuff. I mean, there's a lot of scenes in it where you got live microphones mm-hmm. and playback. And I know the guys in the band, that thing, they were not musicians. Mm-hmm. And the lead singer in the band, Jonathan Sheck, is tone deaf. <laughs> uh, Could have asked him that question well, before casting, day, eh? I remember when, well, they didn't care. I mean, they, yeah, the drummer, yes. Tom Everett Scott, he was not a drummer. Mm-hmm. He had to learn to do all of that. Yeah. Brilliant stuff that he did. But also, we had a great music supervisor who had Pro Tools on the set. I do Pro Tools if it's just playback. But if it's important to do stuff, he would make edits on the set. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant work. Yeah. But there are also some scenes in it where they have to talk into microphones into the PA system or whatever's going on and then be playing and, and lip syncing immediately mm-hmm. or just before or after. And there was one moment where we were doing one of the shots, one of the main songs in there, and I didn't get Jonathan's microphone out of the PA mix soon enough. Mm. <laughs> and so his singing came over the track. It actually kind of worked because they were supposed to be when they were just getting going. They were sort of okay. amateurish and so forth. So the dissonance was okay. But he was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I believe he couldn't <laughs> sing. Uh, but, yeah, it was great doing that movie because the music was all original, even though it was all in the style of 
things that happened back in my era. I mean, that mm-hmm. comes from the 60s, you know, and it was, that part was really fun. That movie is notable for me. I guess it's a sound note, but it's not based on what you were doing. That's one of the only movies where a band is supposed to have a hit song in the movie mm-hmm. that the song is actually good. Yeah. Normally when, like, there's a movie <laughs> band and they're like, this is our hit song, you're like, I wouldn't listen to that if you paid me. Like, And that song is a catchy song. It sticks in your head. It's a great song. There are yeah. a bunch of great songs in that movie. For sure. But if you go back to movies like Dirty Dancing, we had tons of source music in that thing. And yet they were trying to get clearances on that music like the day we were shooting a lot of it. <laughs> and they were losing clearances and so we bring another alternate piece of music. And all the music was, you know, little back in the day, it was like minute and a half, minute 50 yeah. pieces of music. And so I had a second Nagra over here that I was using for playback, but I was having to make actual dubs over and lengthen the songs. Mm-hmm. I had my little editing block where I'd sit it on the top of the thing and I would dub it over two or three times and then I would cut it. And that was going to say about being a musician was a real advantage yeah. to that sort of thing. A lot of guys that are musicians that do this stuff, it's a real advantage because you, if you deal with music and musicians and singers, it's a big, important thing. Mm-hmm. But the ones that were also fun like that, we did this movie Funny People, Judd Apatow directed thing. There's a, a scene in it where James Taylor is performing. Mm-hmm. It's a micro part of the scene. But in order to do it, they brought him out to L.A. to perform. It was just going to be him and a guitar. And we're going to do it live. And... Instead, they realized they had James Taylor. They decided, well, let's just kind of expand this a little bit. Let's see what else we could do. So by the time we started, they brought in this entire band, singers and everybody from all over the country. They brought in all of this huge in-ear mixing monitor system, Mm -hmm. big elaborate thing. They brought in all that stuff, and I just had to kind of coordinate it all and get a recording truck put together for it and, and all that. And we did it, and we had him for a full day and a half. And it was like a concert all day long. did every one of his big hits all live. It was one of the most thrilling moments of my career because to be around somebody that's yeah. that polished and that good. And uh, and yet, of course, I knew it was going to be this much. Yeah, it's right. 28 seconds in yeah. the film. I think, it's on, I think on the DVD, they had a lot of the songs. That's the cool. So, you know, that kind of made it sort of worth it. Mm-hmm. The movie was not that much fun to do. But, <laughs> well, some of it was. I mean, they had all these great comedians. Yeah. Again, a lot of stuff that's not in the movie. We just shot tons. We shot a whole concert of, of all these comedians, some really wonderful comedians. Nice. I got to spend a few minutes with Sarah Silverman. Cool. Yeah. That made it worth it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when you're not on set, how do you relax? How do you unwind? What other things do you do? Well, I don't do drugs anymore, <laughs> <laughs> except the one the doctor gives me. <laughs> um, what do I do? I, well, I was a, bowling was my actual, honest to God, my love. Yeah. I was never much of an athlete in any other thing, and... I got into bowling because my kids wanted to do something, and I took them and so forth. And we got so involved, I got him a coach. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they were still little. And so I let him coach me because I had no idea what I was doing. And he started coaching me, and then I really got into it. And then I finally, he said, well, I can't do any more for you. I need to give you a real coach. And so he got me this guy who coaches professionals. And so for several years in there, I was really serious about it. And it was great fun. But age has taken its toll, and, uh, you know, I really can't do that anymore. So now I'm looking for something to do. Yeah. <laughs> Think about doing podcasts. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, thank you very much for talking yeah, to us yeah, today. This is really a great. blast. Good. Well, yeah. hope you can find something in there. Oh, we got lots in there. <laughs> Spinning gold. Thanks. It's nice to meet you guys. Yeah. Yeah. It's wonderful yeah. to meet you. Thank you so much. Wow, what a great interview. It was great to talk with John. It's so wonderful when we get to do these interviews in person. That one was done at Soundcrafter Studios in Austin, Texas. John was such a gentleman and so much fun to talk to. I want to send a big thanks out to Vanessa Cannon who edited this episode and mixed it for us. Vanessa works out of DB Studios in Beirut, Lebanon. She was a joy to work with. I was actually a pain in the butt to work with her. I kept flaking out on her because just the world has melted all around us. But she persevered and stuck with it and delivered an awesome episode for us. So thank you so much, Vanessa. We have a ton of new interviews coming down the pipe, so stay tuned. Tone Benders is back from its hiatus. See you all soon. Tone Benders is produced by Timothy Muirhead, Renee Coronado, and Teresa Moro. Theme music is by Mark Strait. Send your emails to info at tonebenderspodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter via at the Tonebenders and join Tonebenders Podcast on Facebook. Support this podcast. You can use our links when you shop with Amazon or B&H or leave us a tip. Just go to tonebenderspodcast.com and click the support.